I don't support Leinster, and I'm neither of Saracens fans. And yet, as the two teams took to Tyneside for the final of the 2019 Champions Cup, it was really hard not to get giddily excited. Here were, almost undeniably, the two best teams in Europe, ready to sling everything at each other for the biggest prize in club rugby. And after watching the first half, it almost felt hard to imagine either team taking the title without a three-hour penalty shootout first. Here were two sides so evenly matched you could replace the verses with an equals. It was a tantalising stalemate. Two teams that were too good for everyone else, trying to exact the same on each other. Whenever one side made a move that looked decisive, the other one just shrugged and took the opponent's queen. And yet, still came a last 20 minutes where Saracens managed to pull Leinster's pants down and take the Champions Cup back to Champions Way in North Pendon. So... How did Saracens pull it off or down and crown themselves kings of the continent a whole week before Eurovision? This was a game pitched at test tier intensity with insane physicality married to clashing tactics as both teams tried to get on top. And like most games of the top calibre, it was decided by a handful of moments that were put into motion by a full game's worth of ideas and intentions. Leinster went into the game knowing not just how Saracens defend, but how good they are at it as well. The Saracens defence having been pretty much the backbone of everything they've achieved in the last 10 years. And that Saracens defence works well as it does partly because of its complexity. Their defence changes shape and ambition depending on their position on the field. Generally, over the first 55 metres or so of the pitch, Saracens throw between 3 and 5 players on either side of the ruck, reasonably tightly together. However, by bunching where the ball will be first, Saracens leave one of the wings defended by just a single man. The idea is to sacrifice covering space for applying pressure. On Saturday, all game they flew up on either side of Junefair Sex Dragon, closing his options and nabbing a few interceptions along the way. This gave Leinster very little space to work and there's a great chance you're going to get caught before you can get it wide and exploit that space. However, the closer Saracens get to their own 22, the more they fill out their line and the softer their rush becomes. In the opposition half, it's about smashing them. In their half, it's about stopping them. Leinster came up with a game plan to deal with this. On numerous occasions, we saw them work their way up to 10 line organically, but once they hit halfway, metres became all the more valuable for Saracens and Leinster had to find another way around them. The pitch is only 100 metres long. Saracens gave them leeway for the first 55. Leinster know they're good enough to break through in the last 15, but that leaves 30 more metres they've got to make up somehow, and this was where their kicking game became vital. Juliard Sex Trap scarcely kicked the ball for position himself, and instead Leinster looked to use a particular tactical kick that Conor Murray has basically made a career out of at this point. When they hit halfway, Leinster would work it out to the 15 metre mark and then have Luke McGrath hang a box kick designed to drop just outside the 22. The idea being, a winger can get under it and contest for the ball, and Saracens don't have the safety of being able to call the mark. Even if they can't win the ball back in the air, they can put pressure on Saracens, a team who thrive on field position. However, whilst Luke McGraw is a perfectly good player, his box kicking just ate Murray's and just wasn't accurate enough to put enough pressure on Saracens. The most infamous example of this came just before half-time as he opted to kick long rather than kick out, infuriating fans across Dublin and the bit of Leinster that isn't Dublin. However, in theory, this was actually quite a smart decision. The idea was to pin Saracens into their 22, making the two most likely scenarios from this either Leinster win the ball in the contest in the air or on the ground, in which case, great, they've got the ball back, a chance to attack, chance to score some more points before half time. Or Saracens kick the ball out, in which case, nothing lost, nothing gained. The problem wasn't the decision to kick, it was just the kick itself, which was kind of shit. All it took was then one brain fart from Leinster, and Saracens have the penalty, have the territory, and then they have the try that draws them level. This is brilliant and alarmingly simple. There's some nice phase play in the lead up that you can read about here if you really want to, blah 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 blah. But the beauty of this try came here, as Alex Good threw the world's lightest dummy, pretending to catch the ball and drawing Leinster's eyes for just a split second. The exact split second Farrell needed to flick the pass on. Jordan Lama had been stood reasonably narrow, knowing he has time to drift wider and match Maitland if the free pass is cut. Um, but because Goode and Farrell are so flat, Leinster don't entertain the possibility they might only take two passes to get wide instead. So when it comes, Henshaw and Lama both rush panic and quickly cut in to kill it before he can get any further, trying to be the one guy who reacts quickly enough. As it was though, neither of them were. Farrell flicks it on fast and Maitland gets to make those last five metres all so very easily indeed. Leinster, on the other hand, were not so imaginative when taking their overlaps. Most notable was this brilliant bit of work by Liam Williams, who was playing just his first major final away in the colour of red this year, but there were other guilt-head chances dotted throughout the game that Leinster failed to identify, never mind take. There was another chance that was taken, however, as the game was decided by this try from BT Sports' favourite poor little lamb, Billy Vinopola. For most of the game, the scrum was steady, solid. Saracens had something northeast of Paris 
popularity, but it wasn't a genuine weapon until very late on in the game, when things became tough for Fogarty on Tyne, thanks to Scrum under huge pressure. Now, I'm way to nine and a half stone to ever really understand or explain scrummaging, but with Leinster down Aussie Nightmare Machine Scott Fardy and forced to scrummage with just seven, Saracens suddenly had an edge, and they showcased the most efficient use of an edge this side of U2. After an initial scrum of just utter destruction, Saris made the bold decision to turn down the three points and scrum again. From this position, normally the scrum is reset endlessly as the referee awards three or four penalties in a row, and warns the props, then bins the props, and eventually might think about going under the post and awarding a penalty try himself. I know, as a viewer, the moment Saracens went for the scrum again, I was mentally setting myself for this pattern. And you couldn't blame them if the Leinster players were doing the same too. Not expecting Venapola to go until Garcés made it clear he wasn't going to give them the automatic 7. Leinster were expecting a big drive. They were expecting Saracens to try and milk out every inch in the scrum. They know that's just what teams do. And so, expecting such pressure, Leinster's flankers give all their weight to the effort. No time for focusing on the fringes, no looking to stop the Tongan from Pondy of England caps, they just look to push. With two sources of trepidation in the back of the heads of the boys in blue, Vernapola acts like his Instagram and doesn't think, he just charges. Caught slightly off guard, Leinster do scramble and get into ground, but James Lowe is just a second late in going for his arm, and it gives Vinopola the chance to stretch out and give every single man on that BT Sport presentation team the kind of simultaneous orgasm Billy Vinopola would have been so unapologetically against himself. Now, I mentioned Scott Fardy's trip to the Tyneside Simbin briefly, but I kind of want to hover on his and Mauro Toje's binnings for just a moment, because that was how long it felt like Toje was in the bin for. The two Simbin periods actually almost mirrored each other. Both sides lost their number six, five metres out from the line, and had to defend a scrum five moments later before regaining the ball and attacking just outside the 22. However, I think the shades of difference between these two 10-minute blasts actually surmise where the game was won and where the game was lost better than almost anything else. Whilst in theory both periods lasted 10 minutes, the reality is slightly greyer. I went through both patches with a stopwatch and Scott Fardy was off the field for 4 minutes and 48 seconds of actual ball in play rugby time. Mara Otoje, on the other hand, missed just 2 minutes and 4 seconds of actual action. This means, in real terms, Saracens were down a man for less than half as long as Leinster. Now, it'd be easy to write this off as unfair or coincidence or an issue with how the game was refereed, but it's none of those things. It's actually just a sign of how Saracens played the game. By taking their time over resetting the scrum, Saracens managed to while away the first two and a half minutes out of ten. By dawdling to every line out and taking their time over every penalty, they managed to waste a few more. And then, of those two minutes and four seconds, they spent almost three quarters of them with the ball, just holding on to it until time passed and until Owen Farrell could waste the last hundred odd seconds by lining up a penalty. In contrast, when Leinster had a man in the bin, Saracen did everything at such double time pace I'd imagine they get countless YouTube comments complaining about it. Whereas Jousting Hat Sex Dimples routine always looks a bit like he's pausing to have a seven minute flashback to a key moment in his backstory that'll properly motivate him to take the kick, Farrell decided to hurry up his usual process and just get on with it so Saracen could get back downfield and make the most of the man advantage. It took Sex Drug longer to nail his one shot in the Simbin period than it took Farrell to kick his two combined. Because at the end of the day, the core difference was thus. Leinster played their own game, but Saracens played the game in front of them. Saracens play circumstance better than anyone else. They have a style and they like to play to it, but they adapt to opposition far more easily than Leinster, who are sometimes so set in their system success that they almost assume it'll always be enough, because it usually is. Leinster like to rise above disrupting the opposition, but sometimes you've got to get down and dirty to hit the greatest heights. But then it's easy to forget get that this Leinster team is actually just two years into a rebuilding cycle. An alarming amount of this team are still pretty young, and haven't been grizzled by the scorns and whips and the highs and lows of European rugby that the bulk of the Saracens team have suffered in the last five to ten years. The likes of Lama, Ringrose and Ryan haven't had to face a team like the Saracens side before in blue. This will have been gut-wrenching, but it'll also be a huge learning experience for the lot of them down the line. And you feel Leinster will be better prepared if they do meet at this stage again next season. And if they do meet again at this stage next season, you feel the result could yet be very different. Hell, if they played again tomorrow on a different day in a different pitch, you feel Leinster might nick it. This was a game decided by Sim Binnings, a second half that suited Saracens perfectly. And despite a 10 point scoreline, the two teams remain the two best teams in Europe and still about as evenly matched as possible in rugby. I don't know who would win if they played again, but I do know it'd be something that would make me once more very giddily excited.
Now, I finished the video script and I'd recorded it already before Alex Gude's absolute heroics from the weekend came out. So, unfortunately, I didn't get time to fit any of those in now. So I need to acknowledge that at the end. That needs to be the first thing I do here is congratulate Alex Gude, I suppose. Not on the hiding cut, but on the, the three days afterwards. Fair play. Fair play, Alex Gude. <laughs> Uh, beyond that, I need to also acknowledge everyone that's watched that, so thank you very much for watching it, and thank you in particular to everyone that supports the channel on Patreon. It makes an enormous difference for allowing me to do this and allowing me to just continue working the way I am. I'm going to be going back to the series on every team in the World Cup after this, uh, but I also want to quickly say thank you to The Rocking Kiwi for giving me some great fashion ideas this week.